Hello and welcome to this special podcast from COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics. I'm Trevor Lane, a COPE Council member and trustee, and I'm joined today by Ivan Oransky, co-founder of Retraction Watch, and Ed Pence, the Executive Director at Crossref. So welcome, Ivan and Ed. Great to now, I, I know Crossref is involved in recording and linking metadata, including DOIs or digital object identifiers to help people find and cite research outputs. And it's also famous for uh, performing the similarity check text matching through the Authenticate software. And Retraction Watch describes itself as tracking retractions as a window into the scientific process. And it does this through a journalistic blog and a database of article retractions, which was acquired and made public by Crossref last September. And both Crossref and Retraction Watch have come to have important roles in the global effort to maintain the integrity of the scholarly research record, which of course is also COPE's aim. And the new database collaboration between Retraction Watch and Crossref means their combined roles are even more important. So that's why we're holding this podcast interview to find out more. So my first question could go to you, perhaps, Ivan. Uh, maybe just describe the new partnership between the two nonprofit groups and tell us how it came about. Sure. So uh, at Retraction Watch, we're really uh, delighted to have seen this uh, acquisition go through. Um, over the years, which I think makes sense given our shared missions. Uh, obviously, we have different things we do. And in fact, you could say part of our, some of our missions are different, but very much aligned. Um, I had been talking to uh, people at Crossrail for, uh, again, years. I mean, essentially, since we decided to create the database, since we had funding for that. So it, it, I would even say that Crossref and its its expertise, its uh, experience was sort of baked in, it was sort of part of the DNA. Uh, and then uh, over the past few years, um, and I would go back probably at least two or three, uh, we had you know sort of more directed conversations about what's the best way for us to continue doing our work and also to be able to make it open. And you know these conversations started as they do, somewhat uh, open-ended and and just sort of, okay, what, what do we all want here? What would be good for the world and what would be good for organizations? Uh, and they started to coalesce uh, sometime, I'd say, in probably late 2022, it became clear, oh, you know, there's something we can do together here. And, um, you know, again, as these things do, uh, with everyone being busy, it takes a little while, but that was also an important time to reflect on this and figure out what was best. Uh, and so, what the acquisition means, and Ed can certainly uh, weigh in here and add, uh, elaborate, correct me if need be. Uh, what it means is that the uh, Retraction Watch database, which was launched officially in October of 2018, uh, and so this is actually almost exactly five years, uh, almost to the day later that uh, the acquisition uh, sort of went through and was finalized in, in September 2023. The, the database is owned by uh, Crossref, which means that it is subject to all of the, you know, open um, and sort of licensing, or really, I would say non-licensing, but, you know, functionally. Uh, but it, it's open. Um, Crossref uh, supports the work in a couple of key ways. Uh, one is that as part of the agreement, and this is all detailed because we're both very transparent organizations, uh, even the dollar figures are included in our announcement. Uh, provides a fee that supports the work, in fact, covers our costs at Retraction Watch for continuing to maintain the database at the level that we had, and even to boost some of that uh, in terms of that effort. Uh, but also, uh, equally importantly, uh, they are a tremendous you know, software and development um, and technological uh, helper, if you will. Uh, and that expertise, we're still working on exactly what that's going to look like, but we're in, engaged in, you know, technological improvements for the work that, and for the database that I, I think will dramatically uh, help the community, you know, even more. 
Um, so it's really a it's a it's terrific, you know, and and I've described it as a triple win, right? So there's a win uh, for Crossref in terms of having much stronger retraction data. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that as we go today, um, where that comes from, and maybe get into some of the granularity there. Um, it's a big win for retraction watch because a it means the data are now open, which we couldn't do before because of the way we needed to sustain ourselves. Um, and because we have sustainability for a good long time, thanks to this acquisition. And the third win, which maybe is the most important one, uh, is for the community. And that means that anyone can make use of the retraction data and use it, frankly, however they see fit. Uh, and we can think of lots of use cases, but what I'm really excited about is all the use cases that, frankly, I'll never think of because I, I know my little part of the world um, and I'm just really excited about what that's going to look like. Mm, yes, thank you. It, it does make sense on uh, from many angles. Uh, Ed, what's your side of the story? Yeah, I think uh, Ivan uh, some, summed it up very, very well. Um, you know, we have um, uh, we started the conversations a few years ago, uh, and our uh, shared mission in terms of. Um, uh, research integrity and capturing the scholarly record, I think, meant that uh, we both saw uh, the value in uh, teaming up. And I think what's good is that uh, we're we're each playing to our strengths. And so, uh, with the Retraction Watch blog and the investigation and journalism that that uh, that goes on and associated with that um, uh, can can continue. You know, and and that's something that uh, is 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 really important. And then Crossref focuses on the uh, uh, collecting the metadata uh, and and making it available. And so uh, Crossref uh, makes the uh, the whole the whole data set uh, available. And over this year, we're going to be working on integrating it with um, with our main APIs. Uh, and so we uh, disseminate a, a lot of metadata. Uh, throughout the scholarly ecosystem. So discovery services and uh, reference managers and uh, researchers themselves, uh, you know, can all access the Crossref uh, metadata. And so having fully integrated corrections and retractions um, information uh, will be will be important. And, um, you know, it was something that, um, uh, you know, prior to this, you know, there were multiple sources, there were a couple of sources, <laughs> Uh, to get it now and now that's been consolidated to so the idea to get more streamlined to access access this information right yes i know there's tens of thousands of uh retraction records on there and for comparison ed uh how were from your side how were retractions found identified and recorded through crossref and what's the advantage now of doing of the acquisition because you you relied mm -hmm. on publishers Yes, that's right. So uh, uh, journals uh, publish uh, retraction notices, uh, and um, publishers we were uh, we rely on publishers to register that metadata with with Crossref uh, that can be, then be included in in our Crossmark system. Um, but uh, we had um, I think about uh, thirteen or fourteen thousand uh, retractions, uh, whereas uh, Traction Watch had over over forty thousand. Some of that was, you know, historical going back, but it was also the publishers just weren't uh, registering. Mm -hmm. All the publishers uh, weren't registering that with 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 Crossref. So we still want to get publishers to register that metadata with us directly, but also we can then combine it with uh, what Traction Watch has done, which is uh, using the power of. Uh, human power <laughs> to go out and actually actively proactively go out and and identify and record the citation uh, the, the retractions uh, which can then be used for uh, updating uh, citations and alerting people i think that's a really critical uh, aspect of this is that we want it to get out to be disseminated mm. and so that uh, researchers and authors and others can can know when when something's been uh when when something's been retracted. I think the other critical thing is that um, uh, uh, Retraction Watch has a taxonomy of reasons for why something is retracted. Uh, and that's not something Crossref uh, had had developed or employed. So I think this is a really good enhancement. And again, going forward, we'll be able to 
to integrate in uh, that information to with the rest of the crossref metadata but right now when you download the retraction watch data from crossref it's 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 got the reasons why okay. it's retracted and it's a, a standard taxonomy so i think that'll be really valuable for the community right so that's leads to my next question for ivan so going on uh, will you continue to identify retractions and do, do they normally overlap with Crossref's data sets? How do you make sure they um, don't have duplications or that you do catch them all? Yeah, so um, I, so I, it's just probably worth just at a high level describing our process. And I think uh, right. you have to get to some of the questions there, but I'll answer uh, all of them in, in turn. So we have, as as Ed uh, alluded to, the human power, and that's uh, everything's literally done by hand. Um, and so we've had a uh, researcher who's now our research director for as long as the database has existed, which is a an indirect way of saying that she built it uh, and, and maintains it. Uh, she has a small army of um, helpers uh, who are you know contractors, uh, and then because of this. Uh, acquisition, we were actually able to bring on a sort of deputy for her. Her name is Allison Brightus, and she now has a deputy, uh, Gordon Sullivan, who works with her on this. So that, that's a really, that, that's accelerated things and, and already. Um, but we do it all by hand by actually going out and checking. And so Allison, you know, goes through publisher uh, websites and, you know, other other databases, you know, including Crossroad, right? So those have always been open. Um, there's significant overlap. So, uh, and we actually went back and forth and I don't remember kind of when we were thinking about the announcement, like how do we characterize that? And, and there are ways to dedupe and do all sorts of things that are important, but didn't feel necessary to hold up the sort of the integration. And so, um, you know, our, our estimate is that there's probably at the time we launched, there were probably at least 50,000 unique items. And so in other words, it wasn't necessarily the 43, 44,000 plus 13 or 14,000. There was certainly overlap. There may have even been some more overlap than that. Um, but so moving forward, for now, we are simply continuing, you know, exactly as we've been doing, entering them. Um, and it, they live separately, uh, which again, Ed alluded to at the moment. So it's not particularly critical that we sort of, um, you know, dedupe at, at this moment. Um, it will be, but that'll be sort of baked into the way that these are integrated. And that's one of the things that we're working on with the Crossref uh, development team. And so a user experience team. So um, that that sort of will that will naturally happen. Um, but for now, uh, we're still you know adding them uh, by hand. And uh, you know the hope is that maybe at some point that won't be necessary uh, for various reasons. And and again, Ed alluded to wanting publishers to still provide still provide these metadata. Um, and you know if this helps in some way, terrific. Or maybe this is just a, a way for them to check that they. You know that they're in there. Um, you know the way instead of having to do all the work yourself, you just get a QA on it. That that would be a even that would be a welcome addition. So, um, but we do everything by hand. Um, we, as Ed mentioned, uh, we assign a taxonomy, a, a sort of a, a set of reasons to each attraction. So it's very rare that it's just one reason. Um, and uh, we look forward to people actually helping us improve the taxonomy. Frankly, that's something that we, we know as you as can use some work, uh, just some streamlining and maybe some more logic as we learn more about all the processes and, and all the reasons. But, um, you know, for now, you know, things continue. Essentially, uh, you know, with, you know, the way we thought about it and you know, think about it for the moment is, um, and this gets back to maybe something that came up but we didn't explicitly talk about yet. Uh, in the past, again, to support the work, uh, we licensed the data to, you know, uh, sort of, Places like Zotero or uh, Claravet or using it uh, sort of to check reference order to integrate into software to check references and things like that. Publishers, others were interested in it. And so we had lots of deliveries to make every every day, every week, every month, uh, electronic, of course. Now we're doing exactly the same thing in terms of entering and, and doing QA. We actually added some QA steps, uh, again, thanks to the resources this acquisition provided. So we're even more, you know, we're sort of doubling down on quality um, and quality assurance. But the only client, if you will, is that we deliver to the owner of the 
database and that's Crossref. So that actually saves a bit of time anyway, frankly. Right. And uh, you mentioned how other third parties would use the data. Uh, so now uh, it's open. Um, how do you expect people to use the database to easily check if an article someone's reading or wants to cite has been retracted uh, so that they don't include it in their work, especially systematic analyses and um, meta-analyses, or that they've realized they have included it, so they want to uh, correct their past work. And in the future, they don't want to base their work on flawed or fraudulent work. Uh, Ed, is it, is it, is it just through cross, sorry, I want, this is for Ed, is it just through Crossmark? No, so basically uh, the, as Ivan was saying before, the, uh, the data set can be downloaded now, uh, just as the full data set and it gets updated every day uh, with, with, uh, with new retractions. Um, and so uh, I think the one key route is that uh, uh, the uh, discovery services and reference managers and repositories and, and, and publishers platforms and systems, they, they can actually uh, uh, integrate the data. So um, it wouldn't necessarily be uh, researchers themselves coming, coming to look it up, coming to find that data, although, although they could, <laughs> uh, but really I see the key route is, is we already disseminate metadata to many different organizations. And so they, they would use this to then have uh, alerts within their systems. Uh, that could then alert their users uh, that uh, that there's been retraction for that item and even highlight it. You know, if they've got a bibliography and a reference manager, it could could then give them an alert for uh, for that. Or it's something publishers could even do uh, when checking a manuscript. They could check the references uh, against this. So we see a lot of right now organizations pulling it in uh, to their pulling the data into their systems uh, mm -hmm. to to integrate it, and then in future. Uh, when we have it uh, more integrated into the to the rest of the Crossref metadata, then um, yeah, then it then it could be used in 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 many different ways. And you could well, you can do that right now uh, on a on a sort of uh, on the Crossref uh, test API. You can just send the DOI and find out if there any if there's any uh, retraction through through our open API. Uh, so th so there'll be a couple couple of ways uh, to do that. And then I think arising out of the um, uh, uh, NISO uh, work on this. There's a, a recommended practice on uh, corrections and removals and expressions of interest. Um, uh, that um, you know, I think that there's going to be more interest in you know common mechanism for uh, for alerts going out and, for instance, uh, messages going to repositories and 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 other platforms. So I so I see that that's something that's going to come farther down the track. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. So, so that's the uh, NISO group, the US National Information Standards Organization, and they have a working group. I know Crossref and Retraction Watch are part of it called CREC or CREC, which is the Communication of Retractions, Removals and Expressions of Concern. Uh, so your database could help with that. Uh, for retractions, how about expressions of concern? Is there a parallel system in the pipeline? Well, the Retraction Watch database actually contains expression of concern and a limited number of corrections. Uh, in all candor, we've emphasized um, and then prioritized retractions. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's in the name, uh, it's on the tin. Um, uh, mostly because of that, but also because expression of concern, um, as challenging as it has been to be comprehensive about retraction, uh, which presents plenty of challenges for various reasons, expression of concern are even more wild and woolly. Um, the practices among, uh, among publishers or between publishers are, are really varied. Uh, and there are things that really are expressions of concern, for example, that they're not called that, or they don't have, for example, a DOI or some other metadata that identifies them that way. So we do have them. We sort of uh, would say um, exercise caution. If it's in there, it's real, uh, but don't assume that if it isn't in there, it 
it doesn't exist, which mm. we're much, which is a different message than we have about uh, refractions at this point. And going back to the other point, do you do you keep a log of how third parties are using the database uh, uh, to help other researchers or in their uh, editorial processes. You mentioned Zotero, so that's a reference manager managing software. Is that there's also EndNote? Does that does that link to the database? Yeah, I mean, so far, I mean, and Ed can speak to you know whether it's possible right now to really track uh, who's using it. We we do that indirectly. So certainly we know who was licensing it before and who therefore continues to use it. Uh, Zotero is one, as you mentioned, EndNote part of. Uh, Flower Event and Web of Science actually also uh, uses the database uh, papers uh, from um, uh, dimensions, right? Uh, from uh, digital science, I should say. I, I never remember how they're all connected, but um, I know they're all connected. Uh, there's um, also uh, LibKey uh, has, has used it in, in terms of a discovery platform. Um, and then uh, the Wiley um, uh, software that uses it that uh, also uh, is, is using it in terms of uh, actually helping, you know, manage references for manuscript writing. Uh, Edifix, that's the name of that software. Uh, and there are a number of others, uh, a number of other companies that have, uh, nonprofits and companies that have, have used the data. We also keep a, a very unofficial list of, of scholarly works that have cited the database. Uh, it's on our site, uh, but honestly, it hasn't been a priority to keep it up to date. So we have a big long list of other papers that aren't there yet, uh, but I think there are well over 100 papers there now, and, and that, that number is triple or quadruple actually by this point. Uh, and that's all more or less before the acquisition. I'm really excited to see what will happen uh, now that the data are freely available. Because every single time somebody wanted to use a database before, um, we required a, uh, a data use agreement, even if it was free for scholars. And, you know, frankly, not having to spend that time frees me up to do other things. Mm -hmm. And Ed, do you, do you know who's used the database? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, not not entirely. But as Ivan mentioned, obviously, there, there are people who were already using it. But uh, because we've made it uh, openly available, um, you know, we don't track who is downloading it. And, and who's using it, although obviously organizations uh, get in touch. So I think there's in, informal um, knowledge of, of of who's using it so we can highlight the use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we'll be talking about that. Um, we sometimes do profiles of organizations who um, use the Crossref metadata. But one of the strengths of the system is having it open. It can be widely disseminated and use cases that we haven't thought of and people can use it uh, and, and we don't know who they are or, or, or track them. So, you know, uh, but but we do the Crossref model is that we have uh, all our metadata is open. We do have a subscription service, which is based around um, higher levels of, uh, of uh, guaranteed response time and, and higher rate limiting, uh, thing, th things like that. So the data is just the same. and. Uh, again, uh, currently the uh, retraction watch data is, is is separate. It's not part of that service. But again, as we do the full integration this year, uh, it'll be made available through through our subscription service. So in that instance, we would know who's who's getting. Okay, yeah. and I, I think you mentioned there's an API if uh, people want to use the um, standard functions. Okay. And yeah, question. so yeah, yeah. So the ba there's a ba uh, it's in, it's incorporated into our uh, what we call our labs API, a test API. So you can send it to DOI and get the uh, retraction information out of, out of that. And and as I said, anybody can go and uh, in in our blog post announcing the acquisition, there's a link to where anybody can go and download the download the file. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, now a question for Ivan is. Uh, so you're continuing with the Retraction Watch journalism side, the blog side. So you'll continue to complement the database by alerting the public about new retractions um, through the blog. Um, I'd like to ask, how do you select which cases to report? 
um, especially given that retractions, of course, could be either misconduct or honest mistake. Yeah, no, great question. I and and to just to sort of underscore something that uh, Ed, you know, alluded to, the the blog and all the journalism um, was not part of the acquisition, and, and mm -hmm. so it remains uh, independent. We uh, have our own, you know, five one two three, and and you know, that's the U.S. nonprofit uh, sort of structure. Um, so we decide based on a lot of factors what's interesting, and and I will say that that has evolved significantly over time, uh, which makes sense. I think for two key reasons. One is, which are related. One is that at the very beginning, so we launched in 2010, this is going on 14 years ago now, there actually weren't as many retractions. Um, we actually thought there were even fewer than there really were, but there definitely weren't as many as there are now. You you know, listeners and, and viewers may have seen, probably did see, given uh, shared interest, Nature Story last year, at the end of last year, uh, demonstrating that we had a new record last year. Every year is actually a new record, but this was won by a lot, hmm. which is more than 10,000 retractions. I think the final number settled out about 13,000, actually, because some were still trickling in. And there are some reasons for that, very interesting and somewhat unique reasons for that. But uh, clearly, that's far more than the 400 retractions from Journal that we saw in the year 2010. So in 2010, it was kind of, you know, the sort of the, the unit of publishing, if you will, was Here's a retraction. Let's find out about it and see what we can publish. Um, a, that isn't realistic anymore because you know, at 400, if you're posting once or maybe twice a day, you're not going to cover all of them, but you're going to cover a decent chunk of them, right? 13,000? I mean, I guess if we had 20 or 30 reporters, maybe. But more importantly, that's they're not all that interesting, right? And I'm saying this as someone who co-founded the Traction Watch. Uh, as you said, Trevor, there's different reasons for attraction. We don't actually simply report on retractions anymore. We, we haven't in some time, and that's shifted a great deal for the second reason, which is not just the volume, which is that there are a lot more reporters interested in these issues. I mean, tons more. Uh, I think partly that's because people have seen Retraction Watch and sort of said, oh, there's some interesting stories there, which is what we always said, and great, that's fantastic. But it means that, frankly, we don't have to cover every retraction. It's almost like, you know, everybody's doing that. And we can dig deeper. We can, you know, break new ground and, for example, uh, write about, you know, bribery of editors, uh, which, you know, is not specifically a retraction story, but it's clearly quite related. Uh, we did that as part of a partnership with science. Um, we'll write about, you know, paper mills and people running them. Uh, we're right about other just interesting issues. And uh, so how we decide if a specific retraction is worth writing about, it's a good question in that, you know, in that specific case, it would have to do with, well, how prominent was the paper and, and the authors and, and what have you? Is there a particularly good story behind it, which is quite subjective? Uh, the prominence you can at least measure in some ways. Um, you know, how many times was the paper cited? Like, was this a this really have an impact or was this sort of not, you know, not necessarily paid much attention to by the scientific community. So, you know, things like that. Uh, we're always conscious of trying to be, um, uh, you know, sort of fair and, uh, you know, objective as much as possible and uh, make sure to be reflecting what's happening around the world instead of just, you know, in the U.S. where most of us are. We have one staff member, one reporter in uh, Denmark, so we're at least sort of in Western Europe, but that's still only Western Europe and the U.S. We try and, you know, make sure that we're telling stories from around the world, and we have different freelancers we work with in different parts of the world, but, you know, it's a journalistic enterprise, a very, uh, it's still a very, um, you know, sort of a small journalistic enterprise, so we, we have to make choices every day. Mm. And, uh, thinking about it, yes, I, I can recall some stories that weren't pure retractions and have been very useful in alerting uh, the community. Uh, for example, um, the extent of paper mills and how they want to infiltrate journals through the back door or new ways of um, citation manipulation, stuffing the metadata um, with secret keywords. Um, or, or secret references, uh, citations, yeah. Um, now, I have a futuristic question then. Um, how do you think the database 
could be used to improve generative AI tools by ensuring that they include only uh, sound work that's unretracted in either the training or the searching processes. Yeah, well, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, I think that you know, with the general purpose uh, large language models, clearly, you know, they're trained on a you know a huge amount of material from from all of the web, and it's not clear where where the content comes from. So, you know, I think um, in the scholarly space, you know, provenance and uh, uh, and citation are really uh, critical, and even more so in this. Uh, in this field, because you know the cases where uh, the the chatbots are gen generating, making up references, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that can happen in the case with 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 retraction watch it's, itself, um, you know, and uh, or there were some legal cases, right? Makes up fake fake references. So, uh, but they're clearly uh, applications where they are more sort of what you would call maybe small language models or 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 medium language models where you know where they where it's a, a set corpus of scientific data and you can see some of the services such as scopus or dimensions uh start starting to do this where uh, uh and, and services now uh, where where the sources are cited so in those instances you could imagine yes that they could they, they could be updated but i think it would be very difficult in the general models because if something was trained on certain data and then you know you have these retracted articles. You would hope that maybe they would somehow ind indicate that these things were retracted, but but actually they're not citing any sources anyway. So so I, th I think there's a real problem there. So so I think there's scope for the more specialized services to uh, to you know accommodate and 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 use the use the retraction data. But I, I can't see any way that that you know I think that's one of the problems with these the. the more general large language models. Anything to add to that, Ivan? No, no, I think, you know, I, on the one hand, uh, I would say uh, Adam and I over time have um, become very uh, stay in our lane people uh, in the sense of, um, you know, what our expertise is. And I'll, I will agree that we are experts on retractions. Um, we are, I've never taken a coding course in my life, which is probably something I should fix, uh, but I don't, you know, I, I I just, I can't speculate on that. I think it's a great question. Um, I will say that there's a, as I mentioned, um, there've been enough cases now where we know that, uh, you know, AI is hallucinating references. Um, and so it's an interesting question about, you know, that would be something to check against the entire corpus at, at Crossref, uh, in terms of you know making sure that retracted references aren't checked, that's just something you should probably excuse me aren't cited. That's something you should probably do as a sort of post hoc, not post publication, but uh, post manuscript submission um, phase. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I I did come across a news item in Nature um, recently that mentioned some software using the retraction database to, to try to identify it either preemptively or to correct the, the record. And I, I also came across a, you might have heard of it, Cite, S-C-I-T-E, which tries to give context to citations. So it's not just a cited yes or no, but it's cited with um, support or with contradictions. And I think they are trying to do something to um, identify papers that cited um, problematic papers um, as a kind of a warning thing. So, yes, I, I think um, uh, however imaginative third parties can be to use that data to help the research community. Um, now, my penultimate question is uh, what will happen after the five-year partnership period is over? Um, we always say to people about keeping archives and what happens if their website disappears and there's always an archive in locks or portico but how about this database yeah well i guess that's uh, it's crossref's responsibility now <laughs> uh and we do we do make it uh, uh an annual uh, uh data dump or a public access file of of all our metadata every, every year so there's there's certain points and that's that's hosted on a third 
uh, party third party service, and we've we've actually got uh, archives uh, with uh, Crossref metadata with Portico. So we'll we'll you know if Crossref weren't weren't to exist, uh, then it um, it would still be available. And and because it's open data, any any anybody can uh, take it and uh, and and post it. Uh, and so we're do we're doing a lot of work now at the moment around. Uh, uh, persistence and, and and archiving, so so it'll cer certainly be certainly be available. Uh, and you know, I think in terms of the question of of the the five year partnership period, I think we thought um, uh, you know I think the expectation would be it would be it would be renewed. <laughs> uh, and and I think we wanted to just put five years in there because you know a lot can change in five years and. Uh, you know, so that's a point where we can where we can have a look and review things and and update it as needed. But but the expectation is that you know it it would uh, uh, we'd have an, a revised and updated agreement going forward that could take into account how how things have changed over the over the five years. Um, you know, so that that's that would be my expectation. Yeah, and and from our point of view, um, you know, again, if you look at you know, sort of typical corporate acquisitions, five years is longer than we usually uh, talk about a sort of ongoing relationship of some kind, right? And so uh, already I think we're signaling and certainly we, uh, from our point of view, uh, mean very much that this will be an ongoing uh, commitment, an ongoing uh, relationship uh, that, but we also want to be, again, totally transparent about, um, we want to make sure that the database and, and the work we're doing and the work we're doing together uh, is still, you know, continues to add value. And that, again, could mean that it shifts and changes. It could mean that we continue doing the same thing. But if five years from now, you know, Crossref is uh, able, uh, one way or the other, to have publishers providing, say, maybe not every last retraction, but a much larger percentage, then, you know, what can we provide? And and that could just, that maybe that's just the taxonomy and sort of a deeper dive into that. Maybe it's analysis of, uh, retractions and trends, but whatever it is, we just want to, I mean, the nice thing about being two uh, nonprofit organizations is that um, I don't have, and, and, and of course doesn't have shareholders and, you know, the market sort of demanding massive growth. I mean, we're, <laughs> we have massive growth without anybody demanding it financially. In fact, sometimes I wish it wasn't so much because, you know, it, it just, our team is, it, our team doesn't, scale with the number of attractions we've grown. And so, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. If this were a for-profit enterprise, you know, I guess that some venture capital firm would be very interested in it, but that's a whole other discussion. Okay, yes, that's that's good to hear, a, a good problem to have. Um, my final question is to get your parting thoughts. Um, uh, what else do you think needs to happen in the research community for better preservation of the integrity of the research record. We've been just focusing on retractions, which is the end point in trying to detect and clean up the literature, but what else bigger picture needs to happen? Do you want to go? You can go first on that. Yeah, I mean, I would say, and, and this is kind of a, a message I've been, and Adam as well, have been focused on for some time, but particularly lately, now that there's so much more attention to uh, to attractions and to misconduct or, or errors and, and problems in literature. Um, I, we think it's really important to to move way upstream. Um, it, it, and, and the way I liken it uh, to, uh, I, I guess I've sort of been workshopping this metaphor. And so it's at some stage of making sense, not 100% yet. But if you think about um, sort of, you know, the pollution of the literature that these problems creates, right? Uh, the same way you would think about pollution of water supply or of the oceans, right? So right now we're sort of fixated, you know, both, you know, I think Crossref, Traction Watch, certainly others are almost fixated on, you know, we've built a great sewage treatment plant at the mouth of the river. Um, we're building a better one. We're hoping that, you know, it works and it filters everything out before it gets to the ocean. But we kind of need to move way upstream of that and, and not even build anything way upstream, but stop the river from getting polluted. And how do you do that? Well, in the scientific publishing world, you look really hard at the incentive structure. I mean, it, lots of people have said this. I'm certainly not the first, I won't be the last. 
but looking at why people you know are, feel the pressure feel the need to and again pollution is a i think a good math metaphor to pollute the literature and that's of course publisher paris and i think we need to all work uh, much much harder on that um, and not necessarily think about replacing one metric with another uh, but think about just a much more holistic view and and a much more robust kind of ongoing system of uh, you know, openness and you know, open data, open research, uh, open assessment, um, fair assessment. Uh, that uh, you know, places like you know, people like the Dora, you know, uh, project are, are doing this and, and thinking about light manifesto, et cetera. Um, I, I think that's where we need to go. It doesn't mean you know, but again, it, you can't suddenly say, well, we we need to go focus up there. So let's shut off the, you know, the uh, the sewage treatment plant in the mouth of the river because we got to go focus. No, we we have to do both. Um, but while we're doing one, we, we really need to focus more on the other. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. I think you summed it up very well, Ivan. And, um, you know, I think uh, the I would definitely agree about the incentives and changing the incentives. And, you know, I think uh, metadata and the, the, what we call what Crossref calls the research nexus. So there's uh, metadata about research objects and research outputs. Uh, but there's also the relationships between them and and the authors and the funders and the grants. And, you know, we're, we're trying to connect this all together because then, then that can be used for this broader assessment that I was, was talking about. And, you know, there's work going on now around uh, coming out of the Leiden Manifesto and other things where organizations and researchers looking at open science metrics. So there can be a, a wider uh, array of, uh, of assessing quality and impact of of research and um you know i think that could then help change the incentives because if 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 there's a, a publisher parish uh pressure on on uh, researchers and if it's uh, oh you have to you have to publish in a journal with an x an impact factor of x that's that's sort of very reductive and that can maybe lead to some uh, bad behaviors but you know i think i think there's uh, a lot of good things happening that could help so it'll take time, but it can help shift uh, some of those some of those incentives. And it's really about um, you know trying to have a picture where we have uh, trust signals that enable people to to assess uh, research and its impact in 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 a in a better way than, than it's currently done. Right. Thank you both. Yes, um, I agree. Uh, it's a joint effort from everyone for. Uh, publication ethics and integrity, and it needs appropriate checks and balances at all stages of the research process. Um, so it's good to know, at least now, we have a workable system for the, as you said, Ivan, the pollution part to, them, to catch and uh, notify about retractions as they occur. Um, so Ivan and Ed, uh, thank you for your time today for telling us about this really landmark partnership between Retraction Watch and Crossref, and uh, also many congratulations. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Trevor, thanks so much for, for having me. Thank you, and to our listeners, uh, thank you for your time, and don't forget to check the COPE website at publicationethics.org for the latest COPE resources, guidelines, and discussions, and to subscribe to the COPE Digest newsletter. So until next time, goodbye.